מבין שהם לומדים, שהם רואים את זה. Uh, thank you, Alfonso, so much. It's great uh, to, uh, even if it is the first time I'm in this building, to be back home because I've seen many, many of old friends here. And today I would like to, um, yeah, talk a, a little bit about some some projects uh, where uh, around like, this idea how gene positioning, like you, when you see a gene in the genome browser. Normally, you don't think if you know there, there are so many genes, there is so much, much information that we I think we don't tend to think that the actual place where that gene is can be actually informative in itself and who are their the networks and how this is actually key to, to also understand changes in, in oncogenesis. So, as Alfonso said, I, I recently moved to Cabimer uh, where I uh, had to, to give a name to my group and I decided to call it. Computational, uh, computational epigenomics, uh, which already had that name in, in at Newcastle, but I, I wanted to add something else, uh, like about the biological uh, questions we are interested about, and I thought that actually is a cell identity is is like a common denominator of most of uh, what, what interests uh, me in the lab. Uh, and. So for me, what is fascinating is that in pluricellular organisms, we basically have one genome. And with that one piece of information, we can encode so many different cell type identities. And I got interested um, during the Blueprint project that Alfonso mentioned, uh, and, and subsequently more and more in, the, in understanding uh, chromatin, because basically the, the, the encoding of cell identity, how, what, pieces of the genomes are used in a given moment, in a given time by a, by a cell type is uh, is determined uh, mostly by DNA methylation, histone modifications, and the chromatin overall structure. So so basically, I'm, I'm interested in, in the epigenome uh, and understanding how, how epigenomic uh, changes uh, can the result uh, at the end in, a, in an emerging property that is a given cell type, and how these cell types can uh, be uh, uh, distortion, like uh, alter in disease or new cell types can uh, originate in, in cancer. And I already said this, like, like where a gene is, I think we think it's very important uh, because where a gene is located at the end of the day will determine in what cell types that gene will be used. So as many of you know, uh, genes are not regulated in isolation. So this would be like the typical cartoon that we see in, in textbooks and in many papers, like, okay, we have a, a gene with different components, transcription and star site, exons, introns, um, and, and we use a lot of the information in the linear genome, but uh, in reality, uh, the, the, the genome, the, the chromatin is, is flexible, and what we have is a 3D context. So we have interactions of promoters with other regions. It can be another prom other promoters, so cancers, things that we don't know what they're doing, but they interact. Some of them could be just structural, but, but the, the, the reality is that we, we have genes in a context. And this 3D context, the, the, the 3D interactions that we see are mainly uh, uh, determined by the properties of that chromatin, what chromatin states they have. And we have very interesting uh, <laughs> we had very interesting discussion with B Biolas and Alfonso Krupp this morning about you know, what this, this kind of things, what, what comes first. So we started to, to work on, on 3D genomes uh, uh, with Alfonso. And uh, when I remember uh, one of the, when Biola was a postdoc <laughs> with Peter Fraser, she gave, she gave a talk. She was presenting the promoter capture high C data. And I told Alfonso, oh, I see networks. <laughs> and, and we got very excited since then. Uh, so basically, in, in, in high C data, for those of you who are not familiar with it, what you, you do some kind of, uh, things in the lab, uh, you cut the chromatin in, and you ligate it again. And at the end, you get this kind of image where um, the density of the color uh, in red would indicate the frequency of interaction. So this is a chromosome 14. And, um, and, and basically, if you take any point in chromosome 14, uh, you can see what, what is the frequency of interaction with any other position in the, in the chromosome. 
And here you start to see some patterns. You see some these different squares, and I will go back to the, this, like related with topologically associated domains. But you can also, uh, instead of visualizing the data as a heat map, you can visualize the data as a network because you can take significant interactions, uh, as I'm showing here with these genes and in yellow with maybe potentially regulatory regions. So you can take the network out of the linear genome, and then you just have a, a network, and you can just do any any kind of network analysis you like. But what I want to insist is that I see each cell type basically as the result of a 3, 3D genome network. And there will be common communities, common regulatory things that many different cell types may share, but uh, there will be cell type specific things and cell type specific combinations of these communities. So I like to imagine that uh, genes are a bit like humans. And you know, if you think about um, social media, like you have all the, all the humans who have some kind of device and, and can, can be in a, in a social media. So, so the humans are the same, but the way we combine and we interact with each other depends on the social media. Like if we go to LinkedIn, you interact in a, in a certain way. If you go to, to, to Twitter or any other. So basically it's the same people, but you don't have everyone in, in all the social uh, network. There will be a subset of us, which we, the nodes, and then different type of interactions. So we can think about, uh, about cell types uh, derived from genes in a similar way. Like we have the same genes because the, all the genes are in the genome of, of every cell, but depending on their chromatin uh, landscape, uh, they form different 3D genome networks that result in different cell types with different functions. So what I would like to tell you about, uh, about our research today is about uh, three uh, small stories. Uh, the first one is connected with the, the, the age of the genes, how gene position in the in the linear and the 3D genome uh, is not random. What why would we why would we care about that? The second one, uh, uh, how to exploit network uh, uh, network properties to to identify regulatory regions in this kind of networks, and finally uh, an example of how this uh, kind of ideas uh, uh, and, and properties are also uh, applicable to to understand how cell identity changes in in cancer. Okay, so topologically associated domains have uh, become very popular in the in the last decade or so since the, they started to be observed in in, in high C data. There has been a lot of debate whether they are, they are obviously more dynamic than we initially thought. But let's say that from a statistical frequentist point of view, it's clear that there, there is higher propensity to interact with uh, each other in certain regions. Uh, and then there are like uh, insulated uh, regions uh, or that boundaries uh, that are enriched in certain elements like CCCF in some cases. So basically, uh, since uh, the, the TATs appear to, to, to be described, uh, like different maps have been provided. So you have genomic coordinates, you can see where the TATs are in human, in, in Drosophila, in, in many species. And, and then people started to study the properties. So it, it, for me, what it was really interesting is that actually uh, the, they are under negative selection. So that fusion, so the, the, the loss of boundaries is under negative selection. So you tend to conserve this kind of boundaries. So when you see genomic rearrangements across evolution, um, there are there can be many. For example, Gibbon is a, is a primate that compared to human had many, many different, uh, um, uh, since the common ancestor, many rearrangements. But basically, this, the, the TAT structure is, is mainly maintained. And you can see this across mammals. So there are papers where they look at the synteny breakpoints, so basically comparing whole genome of different species and, and where, where the synteny is lost. And, and they, 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 show a, they, they found a very significant uh, correlation and a clear significant association of synteny breakpoints with TAT boundaries. So it looks like maybe TATs uh, could be uh, like not not in not like blocks not not with walls but but they are somehow limiting the 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 the, the interactions the social interactions of genes and regulatory elements and maybe we could think a little bit about how these uh, tasks could be in the genome like island ecosystems and how we how, how they 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 may evolve more or have more uh, coevolution or more dependencies uh, if if they are in the same tab so Why why gene H is interesting? So gene H uh, is interesting because if we we can obtain gene H from uh, evolutionary 
phylogenetic studies, and uh, the age of the gene is giving you a lot of information, even without knowing what the gene is actually doing, and you can group genes based, based on gene age. So we know that uh, that ancient genes, for example, with, with Alfonso and, and David de Juan, we discovered that they replicate earlier. Um, then it's, it's well known that they have more essential roles and they have all, but also they have more expression constraint. While younger genes, they, they are shorter, they have fewer introns, they evolve more rapidly and they mutate faster, uh, we think, because they tend to be in late replicating regions, but also they have a more variable selection pressure and patterns that tend to be more of expression that tend to be more cell type specific. And, uh, and most of the work before uh, the, 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 the results I'm going to, to show you in a, in a second was centered around the boundaries. So most people have been looking at the chat boundaries and what's going on around the boundary. So we wanted to see what was going in, on inside the TATs. Okay, so for that, <clears throat> we took, um, like David De Juan already set up this 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 method uh, when he was in Alfonso's lab to to date. Uh, I will explain in a, in a second how 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 we do this. So basically, we have the gene ages of uh, all most protein coding genes in human and mouse, and we took published data of uh, TATs from embryonic stem cells in human and mouse, and also other cell types, including some human data from from Biol Javier. So first of all, so how, so what we consider as a gene age. So it's very important that, that in our definition is not the age of the whole family. Okay, you can do a blast analysis and see how far you get uh, to what is the most distant species that, that where you can find some homology. In our case, uh, what we consider is what it was the last time a gene, a gene has been or was involved in a, in a gene birth event. So if it is a duplicated gene, that would be the last time uh, that uh, has been involved in a duplication. So basically the gene age uh, of gene A1 here and gene A2 is the same because once there is a duplication, we consider that both genes are daughters and they have the same age. Okay, obviously the age of the family is, is, is older. And then there are some genes where we cannot detect any any paralog, any duplicate. So in that case, uh, we consider that the, the the age of the family is the age of the gene. So when basically at the end of the day, when was the first time we we see a gene involved in a in a gene birth uh, event? For more details about this, you can go to to the paper that Alfonso mentioned in Biology Open 2013, and also a paper led by Maria Rigao in, in plus genetics. So at the end of the day, what do we have? We have all these different groups of genes. Uh, so the more the, the oldest genes are the fungi metazoa, and uh, the most recent ones are in the case of uh, human, the, the ones born during primates, and in case of mouse genes, the, the, the ones born during rodents. And I want to bring your attention to, to this group of genes, the uh, euterostomy genes. So euterostomy genes, if you see the number of uh, genes that were born at that particular gene age is uh, particularly higher. And the reason for that is because that coincides with the time during evolution that the, there we think there were two rounds of whole genome duplications in vertebrates. <clears throat> so that's why we have so many duplicates for that age. So uh, for the for the analysis that we did, we so in some analysis we we group the genes in three uh, categories. So until Euter, from fungi metastasis to euterostomy, we consider them like all genes. Then from sarcopterygy to euteria, middle age genes, and then the uh, mouse specific or human specific genes we consider them down genes. And you can see here like the estimated time periods in million of years as well. So uh, this this work that uh, had, well, I, I want to thank uh, Kylene James, who is an amazing master student who was two years in my lab, and uh, I'm a, a former postdoc in Newcastle, Marco Trevisan. <clears throat> so they they tried many different ways, and they consistently found that there was a non-random distribution of of DNA genes across stats. And interestingly, what what we find is that the the genes that were born during neutrostomy, during the whole genome duplication of before, they tend to be clustered together in in some tats, while genes that were born after, they tend to be together. So so there is there is a clear non-random pattern. And we we also tried with um, 
with fixed windows compared with the, the real TAT sizes, and we see that it's, the effect is, 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 is stronger. You, you see this effect with the linear genome, but it's stronger when you use the TATs instead of using uh, different sizes of windows. And they found a very similar pattern uh, when they use mouse. So here they use a total independent uh, TAT map in mouse, uh, different genages from mouse, <coughs> and they found the, the same consistent kind of uh, clustering in the in the mouse genome. And as I said, they would tell us Tommy genes that some people call onologs because uh, 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 the sumo ono actually predicted that there was a whole genome duplication and then it was later uh, more or less confirmed. So, so it looks like something happened after the whole genome duplication that I, it's our interpretation and uh, the referees uh, asked us to tone down <laughs> the interpretation, but that, that there probably there were some kind of constraint and, and from that time, the, the kind of uh, incorporation of new genes uh, changed in some tasks res in respect to others. We, we don't know why. I mean, I got this question once, like why, why these stats stopped getting new genes and others? I think it's, a, it's, it's something I, will, I would like to, to follow up. So to, to try to see if this pattern was, uh, again, was, uh, was real or it was just a random pattern, we randomized this, the, we, we kept the genes where they are, but we randomized the, the gene ages. And, uh, and when we randomize the gene ages, as you see, then we, we don't get the significant p-values that uh, we, we, we see with the observed data. Okay, so, so basically this, this suggests that the, there are different tasks with different compositions of, of gene ages. And uh, then we thought that it would be interesting to, to look what happened with essential genes. Um, because, you know, like normally, like all genes tend to be essential, but, you know, even down genes at some point may get essential. So, so how, how, how young essential genes become essential? Is there some kind of relationship with the, with the kind of TAT they are located into? <clears throat> so for that, we decided to, to classify the TATs into three groups like TATs that were enriched in young genes. So 50% so of more of the genes in that TAT uh, uh, were born during primates, in the case of human data, or rodents, in the case of mouse. Then middle age, that is something in the middle, or, or mixed patterns, so basically like things that, that didn't follow this, this clear pattern. And then all the rich TATs, that's basically TATs where more than half of the genes are uh, in the old category, from fungi metastoma to telostomy. So I use this silly um, comparison, like uh, you can think about uh, jam genes as uh, jam magicians who are starting to go, go to, to magic school and uh, all rich stats like environments where you have the very old, very powerful magicians. And how, how, how a, a jam uh, magician becomes a powerful one? Uh, well, we know what the characteristics have the, the jam genes. As I said, they are more tissue specific but they also evolve faster, which is very interesting, like, you know, like kids that learn, learn faster <laughs> than, than, than uh, older people. They, and they, they are also less frequently essential, while older genes have more ubiquitous expression, uh, they evolve more slowly, and they are more frequently essential. But once we had these two group of stats, we try to see, okay, in down rich stats, we have obviously more down genes. In all rich stats, we have more uh, old genes. But then we try to look at the essential genes in the two categories in the, of stats and the two categories of genes. Um, we look if there was differences in the proportion of essential genes. So we took the data from the, 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 the there is a database called OG that it contains a lot of information about the essentiality of genes. And in the, ca in the case of mouse, uh, so the essentiality data in mouse is better because you have uh, data from mouse knockouts. So you see really if there is at the organism level, if, if the gene is essential or not, either for survival or uh, fertility. And as you can see, we saw that if, uh, if a young gene uh, is an old tad, is more likely that they are essential. So the proportion of, uh, of essential young genes is significantly higher if they are in a TAT that is enriching older genes. If we take all genes and we compare all genes in all rich TATs or down rich TATs, we don't see a significant difference. So our interpretation is the gene itself is already essential and maybe it doesn't care so much about the environment as in the young ones. And in human that we use essentiality data from, from cell lines, 
uh, the patterns are uh, very similar and so in the, the, the same trends. So with that, I would like to propose uh, like a, a, our model of a, a bit of <laughs> silly model of, of gene essentiality, that is the location, location, location model of gene essentiality. Obviously, it's not only that, <laughs> but but uh, what I want to emphasize is that probably the, the context of where a gene is is, is very important, uh, maybe with uh, surrounded by these older, wiser uh, magicians or genes, they, they, they may have for example, and we check that we we check that we they tend to have significant higher number of interactions with with older genes and with the older essential genes in the tab. So and also more opportunities to be in a place that will be expressed in a in a critical moment at, at some point in the in the organism. And we published we, we were very happy that we, this was published uh, this year in in cell reports. So please, if you are interested, you can go and read the paper. So then uh, the, the second story is uh, about how we can exploit network properties to identify regulatory regions. And, and this is um, interesting you know, because we, we know that you know, promoters are important to regulate the genes. We know that for cell type specific genes, we normally have enhancers that can be upstream or downstream or the introns and somehow they loop and they interact with the promoters. And this is very important, but actually we don't understand very well uh, if we need direct contact, if we need proximity, if we need one, if we need many. But let's somehow agree that they the cancers interact somehow with promoters, and when that happens, you tend to have gene expression. But obviously, if you just look at interaction data, it's not enough, because, uh, for example, you can have genes that simply are repressed, and they're interacting with the other inactive enhancers that are bound by, by polycom or other repressive protein. Mm -hmm. You may have many non-coding regions <clears throat> that are close to promoters, but they are not functionally relevant, only a subset of those. Uh, some might be a structural, that is important for the structure, but not really for the regulation of the genes. And then the other problem that we have is that actually we don't agree on how to say, OK, this is an active enhancer. Some people like using histone marks, but some people say, no, well, histone marks are just correlated. Some people like uh, to see the transcription by cage stick, or some people like to extract the enhancer into a plasmid to, to check if the DNA sequence itself has enhancing probability that that's like, for example, star sick. So, <clears throat> so basically, even if we have enhancer promoter interaction data, it's, it's, it's not trivial to, to associate them with, with gene expression. So here I'm, I'm showing a, another very, very nice paper that I published with Alfonso, where uh, Vera Pancaldi uh, with Cytoscape, she constructed this, this very nice uh, network showing all the uh, interactions, all the chromatin interactions in mouse embryonic stem cells. And basically what we want is to to illuminate, we wanted to, to to come out with a method to illuminate where are the active enhancers that are relevant for gene expression in, in that particular moment. And uh, and we came with this very simple idea. I mean, not many times you have a simple and good idea that you think, oh, it's actually, it works because probably because it's simple. It, why don't we simply use gene expression? We use gene impress we try to to use gene expression to, and to integrate that with the network to try to identify the regulatory region. Mm -hmm. And um, I came with this idea after a fantastic talk by Rosalba Junio uh, in Barcelona, in a, <laughs> a very nice meeting uh, that uh, Alfonso also organized. And the, and she presented this this nice approach where she had this uh, this disease with very low frequency mutations. They, they had very few patients, but they came with the idea, okay, what if we take the protein-protein interaction data and we propagate the frequency of mutations, we can identify neighbors, protein neighbors, that could also be related with the disease. And then after the, the talk, uh, I, I went to her and said, look, we could use this with protein capture, uh, with, with chromatin interaction data, and we, instead of propagating mutation frequencies, we could propagate uh, gene expression data to try to then, by diffusion, identify the, the gene regulatory regions. So she, she sent me this very nice review uh, that uh, I recommend to everyone, by uh, Cohen, Idecker, Raphael, and Sharon, that explains uh, in, the, in the field of biology <clears throat> how you can use network propagation in, in, in many different applications. They didn't include uh, <laughs> the chromatin interaction data, which was good for us. 
And uh, basically why, net I mean, I know in the room <laughs> there are people who know more about networks than myself, but basically the idea of using uh, network propagation is that you can go beyond the neighbors. For in this example, from this review, like if you see uh, the orange node and you see all the interactions and you only, uh, the first degree interactions, just looking at the degree, all the nodes of the yellow nodes seem equally important, right? Because they are all neighbors. But if you uh, go beyond that, uh, then you start to see that actually, and you use uh, some kind of propagation algorithm, you will identify that the path by D and then the the other node is the by because of the topology, the connectivity of that node with other nodes. Actually, most of the information will flow very often through 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 that node. Obviously, when we take the full network, it's impossible to visualize and analyze by eye. But network propagation allows us to use the full network, propagate, and then see what nodes receive this kind of information after the propagation. So this is our framework uh, to study. Um, uh, to propagate gene expression in 3D genome networks. <clears throat> the one of the first challenges uh, is actually that it's not so easy to put genes into genomic fragments because genomic fragments can have more than one gene. <clears throat> genes can by, be very large and be in multiple fragments. So we ended up having this idea of building a network of uh, genes as entities and then linking them to fragments where they are located. And with this kind of network, then we uh, take the gene expression data from the genes and we actually use the propagation, the, diff the same diffusion algorithm to, um, to propagate gene expression from the gene nodes into the fragments. At the end, the fragment will have some expression value coming from the, the genes that are uh, related to that fragment. And then in a second step of propagation, then we, we, we explore the, the, the rest of the, of the network, trying to identify uh, nodes without promoters that may get um, a lot of uh, imputed expression. And that's what we call uh, imputed activity scope. So basically, the 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 at the end of the simulation experiment, we get this kind of value. <coughs> and the question was, if this identify active enhancers, and it did. So to try to validate the findings, we use um, with mouse embryonic stem cells, uh, try to find as many different type of validation. We use chromatin state data. We use uh, cage seq data that is looking at bidirectional transcription, star seq, binding of uh, P300 coactivator, or uh, activity of the polymerase. And the interesting thing is that Maninda, when he he was uh, checking, classifying the the these these nodes by the number of different enhancer annotations that 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 map to the, that particular fragment. <clears throat> the, the more evidence that we have that is likely to be an enhancer, the higher imputed activity score that we got. And we also, like uh, in human data, uh, we look at EQTL data. So uh, EQTLs uh, is the kind of analysis where you look at correlation between a genotype and gene expression levels, try to identify SNPs that could be associated with regulatory regions. <clears throat> so using using data from, from T cells and, and monocytes and, and neutrophils, we could we could validate sorry we could find significant higher activity of uh, nodes that had eqtls versus ones that didn't and if the eqtl had an enhancer feature it had a, a slightly higher level as well so we uh, in collaboration with uh, the group of rosalba we Ha, we now um, provided a, an R package and with a signy viewer uh, network um, visualization tool to explore the results. And it was published uh, last year in, in NAR. Uh, and uh, so if you if you are more interested about, about the methods and if you have any questions, please, please feel, free, feel free to contact me. <clears throat> OK. So I will go to the the last part of my talk in a second. That where we uh, connect with the concept of cell identity that I was talking at the beginning and how cell identity. Uh, so on one hand, what are the chromatin properties that indicate what genes are associated with cell identity? And then how these same rules, when things change, can actually apply and help cancer. I will, this final story that I will tell you about is that tale of two loci. 
two of my favorite loci since I was in Newcastle collaborating with, with Lisa Russell. <laughs> uh, on one hand, we have uh, CCND1. So cycling D1 is a regulator of the cell cycle and is uh, a proto oncogene that is regulated in many cancers. And uh, it's here you see the, gene, the TAT. So these are the genes that are uh, within the TAT of CCND1. I don't have time to talk today uh, about MyoV, but MyoV uh, is a very interesting um, gene. We don't know if it's really a gene, but we have we had a paper uh, recently uh, this summer about, about this, if you're interested. But basically coming back to, to CCND1, it's, it's a gene that is normally tightly regulated because it, it's only active when cells go into cell division. Right. And so that's why it gets deregulated in cancer, because cancer cells like to, to just continually proliferate. <laughs> so it's a gene that, that needs to be controlled. Obviously, any cell type that needs cell division, or most of them will need cycling D1 or cycling D2. So there are different kind of, of ways of regulate that. But it's a gene that needs to be kept under control. And then we have this other locus. Uh, that is very important in, in B cells, uh, that is the IGH locus, so the monoglobulin uh, heavy chain locus. So this uh, locus is encoding for the for the for the heavy chain of the of the antibodies. And obviously for, for building this kind of um, of proteins, uh, B cells and T cells they use a similar mechanism for TCR, <coughs> they need to break the genome. Okay, they need to recombine the genome, and that's again something that needs to be tightly controlled and needs to be uh, uh, regulated. And there are uh, there, the, there are different enhancers or, or super enhancers because they are very big that uh, regulate uh, this locus. And what happens is that in many B cell derived malignancies, uh, these super enhancers can end up controlling the cyclic D1, as you will see. So. Obviously, B cells are super important uh, uh, for antibody production, for immunity. <clears throat> and in a way, many of the B cell malignancies that we observe in patients are, are the price we, we need to pay for, for having this kind of uh, immunity and antibody diversity. So uh, here you see some of the different steps of differentiation of, of B cells. And what, what can happen is if there is a mistake, if there is an error, because there are breaks naturally in B cells. So B cells are breaking that particular region. If there is an error, that region can uh, be uh, just opposed to the, um, to the, to the wrong uh, partner. And if that partner happens to be a proton cogene, then we have the phenomenon that we call enhancer hijacking. <clears throat> that basically the, the proton cogenes hijacks a super enhancer or an enhancer and then becomes constitutively expressed. The interesting thing is that in the case of B cell derived malignancies, the partner genes, the oncogenes, depend, depend uh, are different and in different frequencies depending on the state of differentiation. For example, you can see that CCND1 is very prevalent in mantle cell lymphoma that is derived from naive B cells and also frequent in multiple myeloma. But then in other types, you can see that the, the size of the, of the gene name uh, indicates the frequency of being. Um, uh, translocated with a, in a with an IGH super enhancer. Okay, and then on the other hand, I wanted to tell you a little bit about H3K4 trimethylation broad domains. So H3K4 trimethylation is a very famous histone modification because it it marks uh, together with uh, 27 acetylation active uh, promoters. Well, so when you see the transcription of a star site of a gene with this uh, histone mark, that normally indicates that the gene is is transcribed. Uh, and even during uh, during mitosis that, that it's kept. But uh, different groups observed uh, some years ago that uh, sometimes some genes have a broader uh, domain that for smaller genes can get the whole gene. <coughs> and there was there was some uh, evidence, not very clear, not not very well established, but the, there were a couple of papers suggesting that that these genes um, showing these broad domains, could be the ones that are regulated by super enhancers, super enhancers being these particularly large uh, enhancers. So we we wanted to test the, the hypothesis that 
<coughs> this particular hypothesis that if A3K4 methylation broad domains uh, is a signature of a gene regulated of a super enhancer, and why why do we care about this? Because broad domains have been associated with cell identity genes. So what they found is that in in genes that have this broad domain, they tend to be not simply cell type specific, but uh, related with cell identity. And what is the difference? The difference is that you can express sometimes a gene in a cell type, or but for a cell identity gene, you need to constantly express that. So using single cell data, they found that these genes were not simply overexpressed, but they were consistently overexpressed in the whole population of the same cell type. So, so and they are also they were also described as a feature of many tumor suppressor genes. So genes that need to be consistently expressed seems to, uh, or a subset of those seems to have this kind of feature. But they, they were not clearly linked to the super enhancers. <coughs> and the funny thing is that when I was talking with Lisa Russell, I told her, well, I think we have data ready to start to look at this because I mean, Blueprint generated a lot of data from B cells, a B cell differentiation from the group of Iñaki Martin Subero. And we actually analyzed this data, and this was one <laughs> the paper of the chromatin the determinants uh, Alfonso was referring to. So we had all the chromatin states for the for many stages of B cell differentiation, but also a lot of B cell malignancies that were also uh, generated, uh, epigenomes were generated for them. So a fantastic postdoc working with us, Aneta Mikulisova, uh, was leading this work, and she took all the uh, like the pre-germinal center cells, uh, germinal center P cells, post-germinal center, and then plasma cells, took the epigenomes and uh, identified uh, at, at base resolution the, the known major uh, four super enhancers. She also identified, well, the three known, and, and then a, a new one that we have uh, called E-Delta. <coughs> And then, like, like these are the super enhancers in, in the IGS region. And then, if we go to the other locus <coughs> in CCND1, you can observe that CCND1 is uh, when when it's active. You see the yellow and, and the green colors associated with uh, with promoter and enhancer regions. And otherwise, it's covered by 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 polycom. So it looks like polycom repression uh, is probably important for the regulation of the gene. And actually, even when it's uh, active, you, you see adjacent uh, polycom chromatin state. But when we now we move from the healthy B cells to the malignant ones, what we found, uh, what Aneta found, is that uh, in the in the mantle cell lymphoma and CL, that the 90% of the of the data tend, they tend to have this translocation, and Iñaki Martin could better confirm that all of them had the translocation of CCND1 IGH we see a broad domain. We see that the, the H3K4 methylation is, is, is covering the, the, the whole gene. And basically, the translocation is, is bringing uh, one or more super enhancers of the IGH3. <laughs> and then Aneta, who uh, is incredible looking at uh, data and observing patterns, she also identified this, this broad domain on, on the right. And she said, well, what is, I think is curious that when we go to the malignant uh, epigenomes, this this super broad domain uh, disappears. So could it be that when uh, the super enhancer is being translocated next to CCND1, that region that probably is being uh, generated by, by the super enhancers here is going to be uh, now uh, somehow translocated uh, to the to the CCND uh, locus, and we had. Uh, and blueprint generated uh, also epigenomes for for this uh, very nice model. So there is a, this is a multiple myeloma where also is very frequent to have this kind of translocation, and this one was known to have an insertion. So what we have is that instead of having a translocation between one chromosome and another chromosome, what happened in the patient uh, that, uh, that of, of that gave rise to this cell line is that there was an insertion of one of the super enhancers of IGH. So basically, meaning that we could study the, the effect of having the super enhancer without altering the whole task. And actually we have like a, another paper where we look into that in, in using simulation. And what we found is, I mean, it was known that this uh, super enhancer insertion is, was associated with overexpression of cycling D1. But then the, the question was if there is also a broad domain there. And yes, so here I show uh, in, in yellow that there is a broad domain in this cell line, also in another one that uh, is, is a reciprocal translocation, the set 138. 
but we also observe that not only there is a prodomain, but there is whole gene accessibility of the chromatin. And this is a feature that also all, all, all other people have observed <clears throat> that seems to be associated with more transcription and, and constant transcription. So I would like to, to, to finish with, with this uh, idea of this model of epigenomic translocation. We, you know, this, this was an idea from Maneta in a group meeting. She thought, oh, this is just a joke. And I told her, no, this is the title of the paper. And uh, the idea is basically if you have a, a gene that is regulated by, by, by the, the super enhancer, you have the broad domain, you have a protocol gene that's off, but then when there is a translocation, so a genomic translocation, uh, then uh, the gene is, is overspressed, but then you also see the translocation of the domain, of the chromatin domain, and that's why we call it the epigenomic translocation. And we think this can be very useful because it could allow us to identify in translocations the problems you have many things that are regulated and to identify the driver once it's complicated. So we think this could be a way to identify the, the genes that are the drivers of oncogenesis after translocations. And um, I'm also very happy that we got this published back-to-back uh, -back with Salvatore Spiculia, who also found that uh, broad domains are a feature of uh, active oncogenes in, in, in alternative data sets, and also in collaborate, uh, collaboration with Chris Brackley, we did some very nice simulation work to try to understand this a little bit better. Um, with the amazing uh, artist, Tinto de Vadas, uh, we got this uh, cover for this issue of human research where more or less you got this idea of, of, of the gene transforming into an oncogene and how the chromatin and the colors change and how that has a fatal uh, destiny. So with that, uh, I would like to, to finish by, by thanking uh, everyone in my, in my previous group in Newcastle uh, and, uh, and also the, the new people who are now starting, the students who are starting in, in my new group in Cabimer. And of course, all, all of you for your attention, and I would be very happy to take questions. So thank you for the presentation, it was really... Thank you for the presentation, it was really nice. Um, one is about these last, uh, uh, you know, findings, right, that you presented. I was wondering whether this happens only with broad domains, uh, and if you uh, have evidence that is like that, or maybe like it happens also with uh, different uh, scenario, the the, the um, epigenetic translocation specifically. That's a good question. So, yeah, do you mean like if, for example, other kind of like polycom features or, 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 or other type of chromatin domain. Yeah. We, we haven't checked, but I mean, my prediction will be yes, but we, I think it would be very interesting to, to look into that as well, into other types. We, I guess for historical reasons, we, we got obsessed with H3K14 methylation, but, but it's true that like for repressive uh, domains that could also happen. Actually, well, actually, Actually, yes, Aneta. Aneta is she recently told me that she found something similar for H3K4 demethylation, I think, but I, I'm not sure. I should check with her, but that, that's her, her own research. So okay. I shouldn't talk about this because this is on YouTube. Sorry, sorry, Aneta. <laughs> okay. And then the, the second question is about the first uh, story. So the, the TADs and the, the, the age of the genes. I was, uh, I was wondering like how this translates to the to the level of the gene regulatory networks. Uh, so for instance, which, I mean, is there, for example, like a, a, an enrichment of uh, transcription factors at the level of the TADs that also correlate with the age of the gene or is, can be associated to that? We, we didn't check, but, but I think it's, it would be really interesting to, to look at the transcription factor binding sites and see if there is some kind of enrichment in, in, in some tabs that are richer in all their genes compared with the other ones. Yeah, no, that would be really interesting. Okay. But we haven't checked. Thank you. Thank you, Javier. Take the mic. So thank you very much. This is just uh for you talk. This is just a curiosity. So uh regarding to the first part of your talk about the the gene ages. So it is possible to classify housekeeping genes within a specific gene age, or they are just spread along all the three categories and subcategories within the, your previous classification? 
So if you, so I think the answer is yes, but basically if I understand what you mean is, yeah, not all housekeeping genes will be in a certain category. So I think, yeah, I think actually that would be interesting in itself, no? like trying to look at the, I mean, you need first a list of housekeeping genes and a way to define them, which is, <laughs> which is not so uh, straightforward, but yeah, you, you have a, a list of housekeeping genes and obviously a, that a, a gene is a housekeeping gene, it doesn't necessarily matter, uh, like prevent that they get sometimes duplicated, right? So, so you could have some housekeeping genes that have been duplicated recently. Uh, yeah, that, mm -hmm. that could also happen. Obviously they are enriched in the older one. And what about the regulation of these housekeeping genes? So what is known? So these are driving by enhancers. It's just only rely on strong promoters. Well, I haven't seen the data myself. I, I guess, no, like people tend to, so in the literature, I think I've read that normally housekeeping genes are not regulated by enhancers, or if they are, it's a, a more clear regulation by one enhancer that is proximal. Well, cell type specific genes tend to be regulated by more enhancers, but I, I, I think you know more than me about No, no, I, I was just thinking about, so how it's gonna also affect into the distribution within the TATs. Because, you know, it's also my gut feeling that, you know, they're like, they, they, their control is like more, uh, not so related to super long distance enhancers. So yeah. it's also gonna impact within the structure of the TATs. No, that's yeah. No, that's very interesting because I, something we we actually included in the paper, but I didn't show, is that we sh we we observe a relationship between the size of the tat and the and the and the distribution of gene. I mean, I would need to go back exactly to the figure uh, uh, to remember exactly. But but yeah, it's interesting because you are saying if there is a more complex regulation, you need more space in that tat for for the for the distal things. No, so how. How the regulation is impacting, and and that's interesting because we, I mean, with with Maria, I think we also look a lot at um, at the size of introns, no? And obviously, genes that are very large and, and have many introns, many times they there's just one tat for them, and uh, how you know, we we got more or less this idea that you know, having more introns could be a way to get more enhancers in a way that you still keep things locally under control i don't know i'm speculating here but but i think i think it's yeah i think it's about the way you frame it is, is very general and i think it's, it's a nice question of how the regulation of the gene if it is more or less needing enhancers and how this they need to be to form the net the pretty genome network that you need later how is that uh, affecting what else can be incorporated or not uh, into that stat if a new gene is is, is coming there uh, or if there is a translocation there I have another one. <laughs> yes, last thing I promise. So, what about the networks? Uh, they're they're not within a specific tats, right? Because the networks that you detect are big, right? This kind of highly connected networks that you can detect, they are spending many many tats, right? Which one? So, you... the, the all the work that you have done with the networks, the network that you can identify, including several genes, several enhancer, for instance, and that you use for propagation, the, the expression, they are involving so many, many TATs, right? Yeah. So we use the full network and we, we, we don't care about that. Okay. But actually that's that's something that yeah, that Maninda who was developing the method was thinking at some point to, to then check how the propagation results. If if there was some some kind of connection with the TAT boundary, no, I was wondering if it was like an extra constraint that so should be yeah, no, taken into. It's something, yeah, it's something we thought about. We didn't check. Yeah. Hi. Hi. Um. Thanks for the nice talk. My question is maybe related to the to the last um part, and because I'm seeing chromosome instability, and I thought you know like um are you working now on, you know maybe um exploring if you know. Chromosomal instability, which is a common thing for maybe oncogenesis, uh, is maybe what causes this type of translocations and insertions of like these uh, broad domains. Yeah. So actually, um, so I'm co-supervising Javier, who is working. Uh, so he he's mainly working on the lab, but he's doing the bioinformatics part with me. So he works with Valentin Comais in uh, University of Sevilla, and actually. What they their their hypothesis is precisely that that 
that changes in differentiation. So basically, what Valentin has published is that that the changes in the, so in response to a stress, you can have different differentiation. So for example, in pancreas, so it is a scar pan, you, you can have like changes. I mean, she, I think she she looked she published something in a different tissue. But basically, the idea would be that there is some kind of a stress, then the cell type respond to protect that cell type and they may differentiate into something else and actually because the differentiation is associated with chromatin changes that can promote the, the genomic instability so normally I, I think the dogma in cancer is that there are mutations first and then gene expression and chromatin changes as a result as a consequence i i i think i think that actually differentiation associated with the stress can promote the the, the genomic alterations and actually that will be at the single cell level, right? So if you have many cells responding in different ways, then you're also promoting genetic diversity because of, of that. So that, that what is, is this what you were thinking about? Or... Yeah, yeah, maybe, yeah, related with heterogeneity and yeah, yeah, no, cancers themselves can be interesting. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you. I want to uh, take the mic too. Why the times accumulate? Uh... Uh, new genes or old genes. What is the relation between the process of duplication of the genome or arrangements on the genomes and the TADs? That's uh, <laughs> the million dollar question. So we don't know why some TADs get the new genes or not, but I think this is related with Viola's question. I think some networks of the, 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 the interactor, like the ecosystem, I see it as an as a, as a ecosystem. I think some ecosystems may be more prone to incorporate new species, so new genes, or some genes for by the kind of characteristics are more adaptable to new environments, but but the people you know, have no idea why this, this starts. I mean, um, obviously, it's not related with the process because the process of duplication happened in a different when they are not that. So it has to be uh, at the level of uh, accepted mutations. So, so yeah. what makes... Um, I mean, I find it very difficult to, to understand. No, Then there will be a lot of genes jumping everywhere and only a few of them are selected if they are in the land in well, the right, in, just, the, in the light, well, light in the right path. They are not just jumping because what you can have is that a new gene can be the result of the duplication of our old genes, which actually, yeah, but they still will have to. So maybe uh, some tasks are more permissive but, to have duplications, and that's why you see the jumping there. But the that the that is not. I well, mean, I have to be very careful yeah. with the with the language. I see here. what you mean. Yeah, yeah. The that is not part of the process of duplication. The duplication happened uh, during the mitosis. Yeah. And then the, the ones that happen to land in a given place are later selected because they are in the right path at the level of gene expression and phenotype. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that, that is not the is the, is not the causal reason. You are totally right. To... So I guess I, for me the that is a simplified way to say the to say the genomic. Yeah. But yeah, it's, it's for me is how the genomic context will favor or or not that that gene to flourish. <laughs> Will this be promoted by um, by gene duplications or gene uh, chromosomal duplications, or this is related with something else that may be um, transposon or transposon related? Because I find it difficult to believe that all, there are not that many processes. You, know, you are sitting in the genome with many different genes, and only the one that end up in the right path end up being selected. That mm. looks to me too much. Well, if you remember, we we. We for the for the the Juan et al paper. So we look at RNA based and DNA based duplications. And what it was very interesting is that for RNA based, I mean RNA based duplication is basically when when the RNA is is then inserted into the genome somewhere else instead mm -hmm. of a tandem duplication of the of the DNA ring. So actually, normally DNA based duplications tend to be located near mm -hmm. the 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 daughter. But, but RNA-based applications, they tended to be in a very different location mm. of the genome and have very different uh, DNA replication timing because back at the day that I was looking at the DNA replication timing, normally the, the difference in replication timing 
between the outer genes if they were RNA based was huge. If it was DNA, it was not very good. I don't know if this is <laughs> somehow maybe could be a way to, and we, we didn't look at, I mean, we yeah, we should look at the RNA based and DNA based and compare yeah, their yeah, patterns. That's why I also work a lot. Uh, hi, great presentation. I would like to ask if in uh, lymphocyte cell fate, that also has a, a role in the VDJ recombination? If, sorry, I didn't understand the question. So if the VDJ recombination... Also has, if you go also fa found TAD regions in this type, in these types of, uh, of, of gene links? So you mean if, if in the IGH region where VDJ recombination happens, mm -hmm. if, if there is... Okay, so this is a very complex region to analyze because uh, this and, and actually what people do, for example, is use B cell differentiation models in mouse where they inactivate the recombination to try to, but obviously it's not ideal. So, so yes, yes, we we can look at that, but the problem is you have more mappability issues and that is is more complicated. But I guess your question is if there is this kind of chromatin patterns mm. in the region. So yes, so actually the what, what, I, what I learned uh, a couple of years ago, which I think is very interesting, is that before you break the regions, you, you have uh, a, an increase of H3K4 um, free methylation and 27 acetylation and high expression. So basically the way to promote rupture is associated with, over, with promoting a chromatin environment that is very open where you get a lot of transcription and that is somehow facilitating that the break is happening there. That's what my simplified version I see in Viola Nodin. <laughs> so hopefully what I'm saying makes some sense. But uh, so, but then at the level of how these different regions interact in the, at the 3D genome level, uh, I, I haven't been following the literature, so I, I don't know what is known at the level of that. Uh, and, and interactions there. Obviously, it's something that if you're not a B cell or a T cell, it will be heterochromatized and, and condensed and very silent. Um, and how this is regulated uh, during different B cell or T cell differentiation, I think it's, it's not very well known at, at, at high resolution, as far as I know. But, uh, but I think it, it, it's, it's a really a very interesting problem. Thank you.